grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father through the Holy Spirit given in the word because of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn to our gospel lesson, Jesus' promise of Pentecost, where he said, The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Dear Christian friends, Last week on Ascension Sunday, we talked about how nice we think it would be if Jesus were still on the earth, but of the disadvantage of having to go th- buy an L all plane ticket to Jerusalem, go through metal detectors, and wait in eight mile long lines to see him, and how nice it is that he has ascended from which He keeps his promise to be with us always and to be with us wherever two or three gather in his name. And we also reviewed how Jesus, fulfilling Psalm 68, ascended to heaven to give gifts to people. And of all the gifts that Jesus gives to people, the greatest was sending the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit, giving the gift to people all over the world of faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ. In our text, Jesus made that promise, and he said that through faith we would also have the peace of Jesus, another promise. Today we celebrate that Jesus kept his promise of Pentecost peace. I have told these things to you while staying with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I told you. First of all, who is this Counselor, the Holy Spirit? Already in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, the Holy Spirit is presented as hovering over the face of the deep at creation. At Mount Sinai, Moses instructed artisans to build all the appointments for the tabernacle and said that the Holy Spirit would come upon the artisans and enable them to to make those things beautiful for the worship of the Lord. Samuel, speaking to Saul, when he was anointing him king, said, in seven days the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will prophesy. Later, when, Samuel, when Saul turned his back on God, Samuel told him that the Lord was taking the Holy Spirit from him. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah warned the people of Israel not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but in the book of Joel, the day of Pentecost was promised, which Peter quoted in his Pentecost sermon on Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the one true God, the triune God. We call him the third person of the Trinity because of the Great Commission, where Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, one. In the name of the Son, two. In the name of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The epistles encourage us to live by the Spirit and remind us that all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons, while also warning us, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Before Jesus ascended, He promised that he would send the Holy Spirit, that the Father would send the Holy Spirit in a new and special way on Pentecost Day. I have told you these things while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. Did you ever wonder how you could trust 
the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how they could record years later exact conversations where Jesus taught them and where Jesus taught in the temple courtyard or, or on the mount where he delivered his sermon? Here is the answer. Jesus said that the Spirit would come and would remind you of everything I told you. Did you ever wonder how the disciples who were often rather slow and in fact were scolded by Jesus for being so slow on the uptake when he was teaching them, how they came to such great understanding that they could write the epistles? But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. Promise kept. And that's what we celebrate today. But we also celebrate what the Holy Spirit has done for each of us individually, personally. He is responsible for us understanding and believing what Jesus has done for us. He first entered our heart at baptism. Scripture says he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And then scripture tells us now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God so that we may understand what has been freely given to us. Do you have faith? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you understand what he has done for you? Well, in that case, you have the Holy Spirit. Promise kept. And through the word, the Holy Spirit continues to teach and strengthen and keep you in the one true faith until life eternal. The Old Testament lesson from the book of Ezekiel and our psalm today, Psalm 51, both describe what the Holy Spirit has done for you through your baptism and through the word. He has raised you to life and put a new heart in you. In fact, we sing every single Sunday after the sermon from Psalm 51, don't we? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. We were like the dry bones in Ezekiel's prophecy. We were spiritually dead, scripture teaches, dead in trespasses and sins. But God has made us alive by giving us new birth, birth from above. He miraculously raised us from the spiritual junk heap. He put sinews and muscles on our dry skeletons and then he breathed into us life and we became living souls. Back when Ezekiel wrote those words, Israel was dead. They'd been carried away into captivity in Babylon and they fully deserved it because they ran after every false god imaginable. They had lost the right entirely to be called God's people. And therefore the promised land had even been taken away from them. But because of God's promise and through the word of the Lord sent through preachers like Ezekiel, God would bring to spiritual life a remnant in Babylonia and he would preserve them in the faith and strengthen their faith so that he could once again bring them back to the promised land. They were dead but they would miraculously come to life again, Ezekiel, if you preach my word to them. And if Judah was dead, how could we Gentiles think we were any less dead? Before God came to our rescue, we were rotted out 
and yet he released us from the dust and he gave us flesh and blood and he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life just think about our Gentile background probably every one of you has a great 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 grandfather who was a bloodthirsty bloody barbarian and here you are a Christian by the miracle of the Holy Spirit that's what the Holy Spirit does on the first Pentecost the disciples found themselves the center of attention in the middle of a big city filled with people who had cheered for Jesus on Palm Sunday 50 days earlier 57 days earlier but then 55 days earlier on Maundy Thursday and Good Friday had turned on Jesus and had shouted crucify him, crucify him that's why for seven plus weeks the disciples every time they went back to their upper room locked the door now all of a sudden they're standing in the middle of the city the crowd is gathered around them people who also were dead dry bones spiritually and Peter preached the word of God and those dry bones rattled and they came together and muscles and sinews came on them and the word of God breathed into them the breath of life and 3,000 of them through Peter's sermon and baptism became living souls that day and ultimately that is also your story as we've been talking about evangelism in Bible class one of the things we haven't talked about is giving your personal testimony and that's because that so easily becomes a very subjective thing and what we want to share with people is the objective truth of God's word. But that's your story. That is your testimony. The objective truth of God's word came into your heart and brought your bones out of the dust and gave you a soul that is now alive in God. We were all zombies and God's word gave us our life back. And along with that, we now have peace, which was Jesus' second Pentecost promise. And it only happens because of the first. My peace I give you, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Why is it difficult to talk to an unbeliever about eternal life why do we sometimes fear doing it well it's because we actually know we all know that it's not an easy thing for an unbeliever to be reminded about things like the fact that just like us they're all going to die just like us they are sinners just like us, they will need to face God and talk to him one day in the future. And how unsettling that is without faith. So that the saying is true. No God, no Jesus, and oh, no peace. But the flip side is also true. K-N-O-W, no Jesus no peace sure there's times when we still have anxiety things that make us worry but how little and tiny those worries are compared to what it would be like to have to fear death and what happens when we meet God how small a health problem even is when you know through faith that you will have a new, glorified, perfect, holy, glow-in-the-dark, eternal body from God. 
And how can we even fear violence when scripture tells us, and we know it to be true through faith, if God be for us, who can be against us? What an awesome promise kept these words of Jesus are. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And it's all because Jesus bridged the gap between us fallen sinners and his holy Father in heaven. Imagine you're a teenager and you've taken your parents' really nice car without permission and you've taken it up to the square in Carthage to go shopping at uh, Front Page. This happened last week. And you leave your car in gear and you get out of that car to go into the store and the next thing you know your car has gone forward and smashed into the front of the store. Imagine having to now face your father. That was our predicament. Now imagine you've got this truly awesome rich brother. And he writes out a check for the damage to the building. He pays extra so they can fix it up real fast. Then he goes to the car dealer and buys the exact duplicate of your parents' car. And he brings it home and he parks it in the driveway exactly where your parents left it. And then he says, you just wait outside here for a moment. I'm going to go in and talk to Dad. And we'll make it all good. I feel sorry for that girl that did that downtown. But this is what Jesus has done for us. He has rescued us from the wrath rightly deserved of the Father and set us at peace and said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He has restored everything. Two chapters later, Jesus warned, in this world you will have trouble. And it's true. But without skipping a beat, he finished his sentence, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus' faithful disciples were all persecuted. Ten of them, discounting Judas, ten of them, plus one, the Apostle Paul, died as martyrs. St. John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, but they all lived in peace. And they all died in peace. The peace Jesus promised and has already delivered to you too. I've watched believers pass into the arms of Jesus with that perfect peace that he gives. I've heard and read about unbelievers passing into a different eternity. What a gift to have the peace of Jesus in our hearts. In John 14, Jesus promised two things to his disciples when looking ahead to Pentecost. Number one, I'm going to remind you of all of my teaching lessons so that you can write the Gospels. I'm going to send the Spirit to give you understanding into all of them so that you can also write the epistles and give my church the New Testament. And then he promised that through the faith that the Holy Spirit gives, believers everywhere would have his peace in their hearts. Both of these glorious promises 
Jesus has kept. Which is why today is such a day of celebration. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen.